Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Kareem Sajadpour, who is an associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's written widely on Iranian state and society, Iran's nuclear program, uh, Iran's relations with the Arab world, and U.S.-Iran relations. He appears regularly on the PBS NewsHour uh, and other national programs, CNN, Charlie Rose, et cetera. Uh, Kareem, welcome back to Berkeley. Thank you, Harry. It's great to be back. Help us understand what the Iranian uh, uh, elections tell us about uh, uh, political divisions with Iran, in Iran today. Well, Harry, what transpired June 12th, the uh, Iranian presidential elections, was a truly historic moment, which is continuing to uh, uh, persist at the moment. Um, I think that uh, obviously many people uh, believe that the elections were conducted under a cloud of impropriety. Uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the incumbent, um, received in 2005, when he was first elected, 5.7 million votes in the first round. Um, this time around, he received uh, 24 million votes, so his uh, vote counted uh, multiplied fivefold, uh, despite the fact that in his first four years, he presided over an economy in which inflation doubled, unemployment increased. And uh, uh, Ahmadinejad's challenger was individual Mir Hussein Musavi, who was a former prime minister during the 1980s, someone with impeccable revolutionary credentials, and someone who I think no one anticipated was capable of leading some type of a, a, a major uh, reform movement. But I think in the last few weeks of Musavi's campaign, uh, it picked up tremendous momentum. Uh, they adopted the color green, green as a symbol of spring, the Iranian spring. And I think uh, I compare it uh, somewhat similar to, similarly to the U.S. elections of 2004. Uh, the race between John Kerry and George W. Bush, in the sense that I think uh, even people who uh, were very passionately in support of John Kerry were probably more passionately opposed to George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. And likewise, I think Mir Hossein Musavi's supporters were uh, far more supportive of Ahmadinejad not getting reelected than necessarily Musavi uh, becoming president. So I, I think that uh, in the last few weeks of the, the campaign, Musavi's um, campaign picked up tremendous uh, momentum. They showed very strong numbers in the street rallies. And uh, no one believed that uh, the elections uh, uh, were, were, um, uh, were just in the sense that Ahmadinejad's vote count was uh, two to one. He received, uh, ostensibly he received twice as many votes as uh, Musavi, um, despite the fact that there were you know, nearly uh, over 40 million people who had voted, the elections were called you know, several hours before the polls were even closed. And I think Tom Friedman put it best. He said, listen, if you win a two to one election, fair and square, you should agree to a recount anywhere, <laughs> anytime. You don't need to react by putting the opposition in prison and under house arrest. So uh, I think as a result of that, we saw the largest protests since the 1979 revolution. Uh, on the largest day in Tehran alone, uh, three million people came out into the streets to, to voice their discontent. And I would just say that whereas uh, pre-election, this was really a mandate on Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's presidency, I think post-election, it's become much greater than that. It's become a mandate on the future of the Islamic Republic itself and on a mandate uh, on uh, the, the question of uh, the, the Institute of Supreme Leader, the position of uh, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, let, let's uh, unravel this uh, point by point. At, at one level, this was uh, an uproar about a corrupt democratic process. So, so clearly, at some level, over time, uh, going through this exercise is important uh, for the people and e even the, the people who cheat in mm -hmm. the election. At another level, it seems to be uh, a fight among the clerics. Let's, right. let's talk about that. I, is this about defining who will uh, control the future of the revolution? 
I think that's a good way to put it. And as you said, it's both. We, we, so what we've seen the last few months have been unprecedented rifts at, a, at the top level, at the political level, uh, but an unprecedented rift between uh, the people and the regime, and something which I would argue has been brewing actually for the last few decades and has really been accentuated during Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's presidency. But certainly at the top level, um, you had the last few decades, um, the idea of, there was this idea, of course, of the Islamic Republic of Iran, which combined Islamic elements and Republican elements. And one could argue that um, the Islamic authoritarian elements were certainly stronger than the Republican elements, but there was this facade of Republicanism. And I think that what this election did was eliminate that facade of mm. Republicanism. I think it was the, the elections were conducted in such a uh, brazen fashion um, that um, you know even people who were pillars of the 1979 revolution, like the former president Hashemir Afsanjani, are now kind of on the outside uh, looking in. Former President Mohammad Khatami as well. Um, so, so that's on one hand. On the other hand, uh, at a popular level, uh, we've seen uh, agitations which we haven't seen in three decades. And I think that um, you know, if you look at the 1979 revolution in Iran, but also if you look at other revolutions like the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution, I think one thing that gets people agitated is when you're when their expectations have been raised and then suddenly dashed. And I think this is what happened with this election in the sense that you know, people had high hopes that uh, uh, Musavi's uh, campaign was going to challenge Ahmadinejad and um, this um, uh, lurch backward to the uh, revolutionary radicalism of the 1980s that were going to overcome uh, and, and form kind of a more progressive government. And when it was suddenly dashed from them in such a brazen fashion, I think it uh, compelled many people out into the streets. And my, uh, you know, friends and and and, and relatives who, who who took to the streets in Tehran uh, said something interesting to me. That they said, you know, we never knew there were so many people like us mm. out there who who think just like us. So help us understand what Ahmadinejad's base is, uh, and how big is that base? And if the election hadn't been fixed, what, what is your best guess of the percentage of his vote? Sure. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's a difficult question. First, uh, I think with regards to his base, um, to, to put it, uh, I think, in, in general terms, what he, the base he um, has pursued, the constituency he's pursued, has been the pious poor, uh, in the sense that uh, Ahmadinejad, more than any other president, has uh, visited the provinces. He understands that kind of the urban sophisticates in uh, Tehran and, and Isfahan and the other major urban areas who have access to uh, satellite television and the internet are not his constituents and he was never interested in courting them. So he made uh, uh, dozens of trips to the, province, to the provinces and you know, promised people economic handouts and you know during this same period uh, Iran earned more money than it's ever earned uh, uh, due to the um, huge rise in oil prices. So certainly he does have a constituency, um, but, but at the same time it shows you how profoundly he mismanaged the economy in the sense that despite the fact that oil prices had more than tripled, um, the major economic indicators which people most pay attention to in Iran, namely inflation and unemployment, hadn't really improved. So I can only uh, guess and what, what, what uh, the, the true percentages of the vote were. I think that you know, for most people I chat, chat with in Tehran and they know, they say that they don't even think the votes uh, were counted. Um, so so I, I'm sure that there's always one chunk of the population that votes for kind of the more hardline conservative candidate. Traditionally, it's been about 15 to 20 percent of the population, but I imagine Ahmadinejad uh, given the uh, enormous economic resources he had, is this enormous campaign treasure chest that he could have gotten even, you know, a, a third uh, of the vote, if not a bit more. I think the only thing that w was very odd, though, was the fact that, um, you know, he won by uh, a two-to-one margin, mm -hmm. and they immediately moved to um, uh, imprison uh, uh, the brain trust of the opposition, mm -hmm. as if they were anticipating some type of an uprising. And, and would the uh, 
is the concern about doing uh, democracy and, and, and republicanism in the right way, is that just a concern of the middle class and the international community? Or uh, does the urban poor think about this at all? You know, the, uh, it's a good question. I think that at the end of the day, uh, like voters around the world, uh, the number one priority of many Iranians is uh, their economic well-being. And if under Ahmadinejad's watch, inflation had been cut in half and unemployment had been cut in half, I'm not sure if uh, the Republican element of the Islamic Republic would have been as important to them had their economic lot improved. Uh, but the fact that it hadn't uh, improved and I think some of their, um, um, the, the social freedoms which had been attained under the administration of the previous president, Mohammad Khatami, the social freedoms and the political freedoms had also been curtailed. I think this kind of compounded uh, the problem. But uh, uh, amongst the middle class in Iran, uh, this idea of, of kind of the, the uh, a certain democratic culture has taken hold in Iran the last few decades. I think there have been over um, 30 different types of elections, whether it's presidential elections, parliamentary elections, municipal elections, since the 1979 revolution. So I think people have learned this process of going to the polls and voting. I think the last decade, certainly, people have become disillusioned uh, in the sense that they don't feel that um, their, they can change their future via the ballot box. Um, because what happens in Iran is that the unelected institutions, namely the institution of the Supreme Leader and the Guardian Council, have constitutional authority over the elected institutions. So I think that in 2005, when Ahmadinejad was elected, many people didn't even go to the polls because they said, well, we voted en masse during the Khatami era, and we weren't able to change mm. our fate to, uh, via the ballot box. So voting in Iran is really an exercise in a futility. And I think the conclusion they reached, uh, having not voted in 2005, is actually does make a difference because you know there's a difference between someone like a Muhammad Khatami and a Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. So you know it's better to vote for the lesser of evils rather than not participate at all. And I think that this time around, that's what they chose to do. And the fact that it didn't even make any difference, I think, really mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, pushed people in a direction which has been unprecedented since 1979. Sounds familiar, yeah. <laughs> that description yeah. of uh, the choice between two different mm. candidates. Uh, uh, now let's talk about the base of Musa, Musa. You've yeah. already touched on it, but, but how, who, who are his supporters? Obviously the middle class. I think that's right, the, the, the middle class and maybe the, the urban sophisticates. I would argue probably in a city like Tehran, uh, he has a very large base or other urban areas like Esfahan and Shiraz. Um, but, you know, Musavi is no um, uh, secular progressive himself. He's someone who has impeccable revolutionary credentials. He was very close to the founder of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini. Um, uh, but I would argue that he has a very wide um, social base in the sense that um, his wife proved a tremendous asset uh, during his campaign. I kind of compare them to not Barack and Michelle Obama, but Bob and Elizabeth Dole mm -hmm. in the sense that they were kind of a two-in-one package, and I think his wife appealed to uh, female voters and especially um, the, the younger population, and um, so, so in, in the professional classes, and even, you know, a lot of the, the religious classes, um, I think, uh, liked Musavi in the sense that he was kind of more of a religious um, traditionalist, whereas Ahmadinejad was seen, uh, is seen by many as kind of a more um, uh, his religious views are a bit more in the realm of superstition and um, pursuing kind of um, uh, messianic um, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, kind of uh, um, uh, these themes of, uh, um, of uh, messianism uh, he uses for political expediency. So I think even amongst the senior clergy there was more support for uh, Musavi than there was Ahmadinejad. And I, that's what I just wanted to touch on. So help, so help us understand the base of these two candidates among the clerical establishment, mm. because there seems to be a jockeying for position. I get the sense that over time, uh, 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 that the president Ahmadinejad had, uh, on the one hand, narrowed his base, 
but on the other hand had broadened it with important institutions in society. Mm. Well, uh, certainly I think the oil wealth which had been amassed the last four years uh, helped him in trying to appeal to groups who might not otherwise uh, have supported him. Um, and you know, one important group to, to look at these days, I call them the X factor in Iran, is the institution of the Revolutionary Guards. Because mm -hmm. really the Revolutionary Guards have eclipsed the institution of the clergy in terms of their economic and political prowess. And the Revolutionary Guards are Iran's elite fighting force. They're about 125,000, 150,000 uh, men. And whereas, you know, 10 years ago, if you were to look at the powerful uh, forces in Iran, you would say, um, you know, they're all uh, clergymen. Uh, now, uh, it's, it's been kind of the Revolutionary Guards who uh, have really begun to take over the show. I think they form a majority, former Revolutionary Guardsmen form a majority and the parliament, Ahmadinejad himself has a background in the Revolutionary Guards. And the Revolutionary Guards are essentially running Iranian foreign policy in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and Lebanon. And neither of these institutions is monolithic, meaning neither the clergy are monolithic nor are the Revolutionary Guards monolithic. You can find hardline elements in the clergy and moderate elements. You can find very hardline elements amongst the Revolutionary Guards and very moderate elements as well. Uh, w what I would say, though, has transpired is that the, uh, the, the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, had become more powerful uh, than he's ever been in his 20-year tenure as supreme leader. And one of the reasons why is that he has this tremendous network of institutions at his disposal. If you look at, you know, again, the most powerful institutions, it's Revolutionary Guards, the Presidency, the Parliament, the Guardian Council. All of these institutions are currently led by individuals who were either directly appointed by Khamenei or are unfailingly loyal to him. And he has long uh, appointed the top commanders of the Revolutionary Guards. And I think that um, you know, one thing he did with the 2005 election and also this election is to kind of throw his weight and muscle uh, behind Ahmadinejad. I think Ahmadinejad um, when we talk about his base and his constituency, well, this, the support of this one individual, the Supreme Leader, is probably more important for him than the support, any, any type of popular support he has. And had it not been for the support of the Supreme Leader, uh, I don't think that uh, Ahmadinejad would have been elected in 2005, nor would he have been um, uh, given a second chance this time in 2009. Uh, what is the relationship of the Revolutionary Guard to the military, how, how do you compare the size of mm. the two? And I, I, could you conceive of any situation where they would be at each other in, if, if, if the situation deteriorated? Well, the Revolutionary Guards are, are a much more elite unit than the regular military, which is essentially conscripts. And I think the, the, the military at any one time you could have over a million people is very, very large. Um, but they're essentially have been uh, apolitical the last few decades. And um, you know they, they are not considered kind of a, a cohesive unit, whereas the Revolutionary Guards, I think, um, there's only two groups in Iran which are really armed and organized. One is the Revolutionary Guards, and one is the Basij militia. You know, much more ideological in orientation. Um, I, I I don't. It's, it's difficult to conceive um, of the two groups fighting uh, one another. And in fact, this is why the Revolutionary Guards were even started in the first place, to be the protectors of the revolution. Because when the revolution happened in 1979, they, uh, the, the post-revolutionary government inherited the Shah's army. And Khomeini was very skeptical uh, of the Shah's army. He said, you know, these guys were trained under the Shah and we, we can't take their loyalty uh, uh, for granted. Um, so therefore, we need to create uh, a parallel uh, body, which is, you know, potentially going to protect us from a counter coup, and it grew, uh, uh, you know, from from probably uh, a few hundred people uh, back in the 1979 to the institution which it is uh, today, and so, you know, I think that the army is not going to clamp down on the population in the event of continued tumult. Um, and I, I don't think that the, the, it's a likely prospect that they would um, fight with the Revolutionary Guards. I think what is within the realm of possibilities 
is uh, months down the road or years down the road, if this tumult and popular uprising continues, uh, I think we could start to see splits amongst the Revolutionary Guards themselves because from what I'm told from many people um, who are in the know in Tehran and when I was based in Tehran I saw this as well, is that uh, men who have fought in wars uh, and you know you had two, three generations of Revolutionary Guardsmen who fought in the Iran-Iraq war oftentimes are far less ideological than their civilian counterparts because they've seen the horrors of war firsthand. Um, and, and so I think you know, many people have told me that they, they think a majority of Revolutionary Guardsmen, the rank and file, actually voted for Musavi. Um, so I think that if this, these popular agitations continue and the Revolutionary Guards are asked to crack down on their own countrymen, uh, we could start to see uh, fissures emerge. But at the moment, the top leadership is directly appointed, to, directly appointed by Ayatollah Khamenei. And I think you know, so far they've remained loyal to him. Uh, how does the, the, this whole issue of the Revolutionary Guard and the clerics and their relation to the problem of business enterprise corruption? Because in, in, when one talks about the division uh, uh, within the clerics, it was alleged that some of the clerics had become, like uh, Raf Sanjani, mm. had become fat cats, yeah. basically. Uh, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, the, the Revolutionary Guards themselves seem to have gotten into various business, so th there's an element of corruption in the way there is with the Pakistani military. So more is involved than just their military interests. Absolutely. You know, they've, uh, as I said, they've not only, uh, the, as their political prowess has grown, their economic prowess has grown tremendously. And uh, one of the things that's resulted over the last four years, especially, uh, given the fact that the uh, major companies of the world, especially the major oil companies in the world, the Shells and the Totals and the Chevrons and others are not doing business in Iran, is that Revolutionary Guard companies and Revolutionary Guard front companies have sought to fill that void. Um, and they've gotten you know, billion dollar contracts through um, non-competitive bids. And again, you know, it's, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship as they're economic uh, interests and influence increases also than their political influence uh, increases. And, and I think that certainly if you're looking at the, the trend lines in Iran, um, you can see that uh, former Revolutionary Guardsmen are the ones who are now considered uh, the fat cats um, as opposed to you know, the, the, the clergy, whereas 10, 15 years ago the focus was much more on clergy. Uh, and the sons of, of clerics becoming rich. Now it's former Revolutionary Guardsmen or the children of Revolution, Revolutionary Guardsmen getting rich. And you know, one thing that's interesting to note, I always tell people that, <clears throat> say 10, 15 years ago, if you wanted to um, talk about you know, a powerful person in Iran, you would say, well, he's the son or the brother of you know, such and such cleric. Mm -hmm. And now if you want to you know, impress someone by someone's uh, uh, denoting their power, you would say, well, He's the son or the brother of, of such and such uh, revolutionary guardsmen. So it's a process which has happened in slow motion, but uh, I, I think certainly uh, during Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's presidency, uh, it's, it's it accelerated these trend lines uh, more in the direction of kind of a military state than a, a clerical state. Uh, and briefly explain to us what the Basij is, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 because they were an important element in turning against the crowds. Yeah, the Basij uh, militia are kind of, the, um, as I said, a poor stepsister to the Revolutionary Guards. And it's a uh, vast entity. Um, I think you, you have as many as several million people who are on the Basij payroll. And it can be misleading because, for example, outside of Tehran, um, the Basij, I've, I've had friends, uh, sociologists who study the Basij, kind of describe them as a uh, Islamic Boy Scouts. Uh, they do, you know, activities that Boy Scouts do in the provinces. They mm. go hiking and, you know, have group activities. And um, uh, but, but at the same time, there's kind of an element of uh, ideological indoctrination. And so during times of uh, tumult or uprisings, uh, the Basij, uh, I think a small percentage of the Basij uh, can be counted on to come and crack down on the population. But uh, I think that the percentage of Basij who uh, are, are shock troops are, are much smaller. You know, I think they're, they're probably uh, at most tens of thousands uh, in number. 
um, and and um, you know the, in the past they were also and tasked with kind of enforcing um, Islamic mores. They would uh, go to inside people's homes if they were having parties and make sure they weren't uh, drinking alcohol and uh, and things like that. But um, but um, certainly I think the Basij the last few months their uh, reputation has uh, suffered tremendously uh, amongst the Iranian people because we all saw these. Uh, images of the tremendous brutality that was used um, to to enforce the election results. Uh, when when looks at the this internal situation in Iran, obviously since the elections, it's become much more confusing. Mm -hmm. And and I guess the the big question becomes when you talk about the role of the Revolutionary Guards, mm -hmm. when you talk about the mouthings of the president of Iran vis-a-vis -vis the Holocaust. Uh, as, a, as a person who, who knows international relations mm. and so on, uh, is this a, that is uh, Iran, is it a rational actor in the state system or does do all of the, does this domestic mix uh, 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 increase the irrationality of the country as a state actor? Sure. That's a, it's a very important question. I mean, I would say that, uh, especially the last three months, Iran has shown itself to be an odious regime uh, capable of using great brutality against its own uh, population. Um, but it's not a suicidal regime. On the contrary, I think what they've shown the last four months is that they ruthlessly want to stay in power. They're not interested in martyring themselves. And, you know, I think that when we talk about um, Iran's uh, foreign policy and its, its nuclear policy as well, um, they've really outsourced the concept of martyrdom to Palestinian groups, which they support, and you know, Lebanese groups like Hezbollah, whom they support. Um, but, but, but certainly this regime, they, um, they, they use this type of rhetoric of uh, messianism and, and things like that for, I think, uh, domestic political expediency and regional political expediency. They, they, it, it allows, by, by kind of being more Palestinian than the Palestinians themselves and taking a very hardline position towards the United States and Israel, I think it helps allow Shiite, Persian, Iran to transcend this Arab-Sunni divide. Um, but but um, I think, you know, at a popular level, uh, it's not something which has tremendous purchase uh, anymore amongst a uh, very young Iranian population. You know, two-thirds of the country is under 32. And this type of, you know, Holocaust denial and belligerence toward Israel and the United States, I, I don't think appeals to many people anymore. And, and is the, uh, the Holocaust denial in particular, d does do the groups and the president who, who speak about this, do they actually believe it? And to what extent is there a, an anti-Semitic base within the country that, that gives a domestic payoff? I don't think at a, at a popular level this is something that really resonates. On the contrary, uh, I think many people are surprised to know that Iran has the largest Jewish community in the Muslim Middle East. Uh, at one point it was, it was uh, close to 100,000 pre-revolution, but to this day, you still have about 25,000 people, uh, Jews living uh, in Iran. And so I think at a popular level, um, there's not um, uh, this type of kind of uh, uh, anti-Semitic overtones don't uh, resonate as they might uh, perhaps in the Arab world. I'll give you one kind of anecdotal example is that um, I think if you go to book stands in Cairo or Beirut or Damascus, uh, you will see these books, kind of like the um, uh, protocols of the elders of Zion being sold. Uh, and Iranian uh, uh, newsstands, you won't find that. And I once asked the guy why, and he said, because no one buys that stuff. If they want to um, ingest that type of uh, propaganda, they can turn on state television. They don't need to go out, go out and buy this. So I think at a popular level, it certainly doesn't resonate. But I think at a political level, this is something, you know, this enmity towards Israel is something that the Iranian elite, uh, particularly this uh, current crop of, uh, of leaders, these hardline leaders, feel very strongly about. Uh, and it's not something that is merely, um, you know, I think surely it's used for political expediency, both at a domestic and a regional level, but uh, it's something that they also 
uh, feel strongly in their hearts. And it goes back to the 1960s, uh, uh, before the, the revolution even occurred. I think many of them, as revolutionaries, cut their teeth on the Palestinian issue. Um, and, and so I think, um, you know, if you, if you look at the speeches and writings of Ayatollah Khamenei as well, it's remarkable that, you know, over a 20-year period, um, the topic which he's probably touched upon more than any other thing has been uh, uh, Israel-Palestine and, you know, uh, attacking, quote-unquote, the Zionist entity. And I find this remarkable given the fact that Iran doesn't have any direct land or border disputes with, with Israel. There's no Palestinian refugee population uh, in Iran. Um, as I said, Iran has a long history of um, uh, tolerance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Jewish people and actually a long history of rivalry with Arab countries. Uh, why the leader of Iran uh, would feel compelled to focus so much on, on uh, on the Palestinian issue, and I think you know, if they, they, for some, for, for for them, it's something that they they feel very strongly about. It's not something which they um, um, simply um, sure. There's an element of it, uh, political expediency, but I think they they believe it as well. Uh, how does the uh, nuclear program fit into this equation? Uh, who supports it? Uh, is it? Uh, uh, well, one has to believe that there is a, 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 a hidden program to go after nuclear weapons. And if they were to achieve that capability, uh, who would have their finger on the button? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's difficult to speculate about these things. But what I would argue is that uh, Iran has long been in pursuit of a nuclear weapons capability, kind of being uh, wanting to be a key turn away or a screwdriver uh, turn away from having uh, the ability to weaponize when and if they uh, deem it necessary along the lines of uh, Japan. I think they're looking at the Japan model more than, say, the North Korea uh, model. And I think it's widely believed that um, you have a very, very small uh, clique of individuals who are in the know when it comes to Iran's nuclear program. And it's primarily being run by the Revolutionary Guards, senior Revolutionary Guardsmen, uh, with the supreme leader Ayatollah Khamenei kind of continuing to steer that nuclear ship. And he is not, to repeat, he is a person who has consolidated the revolution, who is more of a politician than a theologian, and uh, who, who, who basically, in the end, is not irrational, although his, his uh, speeches may be on occasion. Yeah, he's someone who has now been supreme leader for 20 years, and he was someone who he didn't have, he never had the credentials of his predecessor, Ayatollah Khomeini, whereas Khomeini was a bona fide grand Ayatollah with real um, uh, clerical credentials. Uh, Khomeini was a mid-ranking cleric, uh, Hojatul Islam, Hojatul Islam, uh, not an Ayatollah. And he was essentially made an Ayatollah overnight after Khomeini died. And the reason why he was chosen to replace Khomeini is essentially he was kind of the least offensive option. He was a consensus choice. And he was going to be someone who would remain loyal to the ideals of the 1979 revolution, remain loyal to Khomeini's vision for Iran. And so initially when he, he started off in 1989, I think people's expectations were, were very low. And he took this very kind of deliberate, uh, subtle approach and gradually amassed power and concentrated uh, authority. And, you know, in terms of his worldview, I think you don't stay in power 20 years if you're irrational or messianic. As I said, he, he's very calculating, um, but he has a very deeply ideological uh, worldview. Um, and I think that he's someone who um, I take him at face value in the sense that, um, you know, as opposed to Ahmadinejad, for example, who I think um, uses elements of uh, uh, messianism and, uh, and others for, I think, uh, domestic political experience. I think Khamenei, um, by and large, his track record shows that um, his words are a reflection, more or less, of his policies. And, um, so, so, and, and I think that um, you know, he's long subscribed to 
I think Khomeini's uh, view of, for example, U.S.-Iran relations, Ayatollah Khomeini once said that the relationship between the United States and Iran is like that between a wolf and a sheep. And I think Khomeini is also very suspicious and skeptical and cynical about uh, U.S. intentions. And you know, for, for the last decade especially, uh, I think uh, Iran's foreign policies uh, have been very much dictated and guided by, by, by Khamenei. Uh, then now let's move to relations with the United States. Uh, we have a new administration. President Obama is ran on a platform and seems to be trying to implement a policy of engagement. What uh, would, would Iran want from these talks with the United States? Mm. Now, I would first say, Harry, that I think that um, uh, the Obama administration's uh, approach toward Iran has been very interesting in the sense that during um, eight years of the Bush administration, there was very limited contact between the United States and Iran, and then the relationship got very hostile in the latter part of the Bush presidency. And paradoxically, Iran, uh, Iran's influence and power uh, grew substantially during that period, especially in the aftermath of the Iraq war. Iran had newfound influence in the aftermath of the war against Afghanistan. Iran had newfound influence. And the sudden increase in oil prices, I think, um, um, seriously um, augmented Iran's uh, confidence. And I think uh, you know, during especially the latter years of the Bush administration, much of the focus was on the fact that the uh, Bush administration refused to, quote unquote, engage Iran or dialogue with Iran. And this was one of the important mantras of candidate Obama's uh, campaign, that you know, he was going to take a different approach to foreign affairs and um, diplomacies about talking to one's enemies. And I think many people believe that um, uh, simply uh, an engagement approach from the United States was going to fundamentally alter the U.S.-Iran relationship. And I recall when, when Obama was first elected, I, I said that you know, I think we have to pursue, we have to probe a seemingly facile but fundamental question, and that is why does Iran behave the way it does? Are Iranian policies a reaction to punitive U.S. measures, or are Iranian policies driven by this immutable revolutionary ideology, which was you know, born in 1979 and is really in incapable of changing? And what I would argue is that in the first nine months or so of the Obama uh, uh, presidency, uh, it's been proven that it's more of the latter than the former in the sense that uh, the president made an overture to Iran in his inauguration speech. He said the United States will extend its hand if uh, Iran, it didn't mention Iran, but it was implicitly Iran unclench its fist. Um, he sent a New Year's, a Nordus greeting to Iran, uh, implicitly recognizing the revolution by calling Iran the Islamic Republic of Iran. This was unprecedented. And he sent two private letters to the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, uh, assuring Khamenei that U.S. policy was to recognize the sovereignty uh, of Iran and respect its legitimacy, and the U.S. was no longer in the business of regime change. And given the fact that um, Iran did not really reciprocate uh, uh, these overtures, I think it led many people to the conclusion um, that uh, you know, it takes two to tango, and it's very difficult to reach a modus vivendi uh, with the regime who needs you as an enemy in some ways, or, or, or enmity towards um, the United States, or opposition to the United States, was such a fundamental pillar of the 1979 revolution. It remains so central to the identity of the Islamic Republic. Um, so now with regards to the nuclear issue, I think that on one hand, uh, the uh, uh, Iranian regime uh, given the fact that they've ceded so much enormous, uh, they've ceded such uh, uh, enormous legitimacy domestically, uh, I think wants to to become involved with some type of a negotiation with great powers to show their own population that you know great powers, the United States are are talking to us and and we're legitimate. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there's always going to be this tension at a domestic level uh, amongst the hardliners who are currently in power who fear that um, anti-Americanism or opposition to the United States is in their DNA, it's central to the identity of the Islamic Republic. And if they were to abandon that, it would be abandoning one 
of the fundamental principles of the revolution and could profoundly change the character uh, of the Islamic Republic. So I think that they're, they're in this dilemma and that I think they're in between confrontation and accommodation. And I, I, I expect that they're going to continue on that path whereby um, at times when they're vulnerable, uh, I think they'll be willing to make some type of uh, tactical concessions uh, until they're stronger when they don't have to make uh, tactical concessions. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned yesterday in your lecture, there are so many critical issues in U.S. foreign policy, Afghanistan, Iraq, energy security, uh, relations uh, uh, with Israel, uh, and then in turn the mm. Palestinian problem, that, that uh, 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 Iran is kind of implicated in all of those issues. Yeah. And so the Obama administration faces on its side a dilemma of just focusing on the nuclear issue, which is of great concern to Israel mm. and some of our allies, versus sitting down and saying, well, let's reach a grand bargain and deal on all of these issues. Well, that's right. As I said, you know, there's, if you look at the major U.S. foreign policy challenges which the Obama administration faces, there's Afghanistan is a huge one, especially for this Obama administration, which has put um, so much emphasis on Afghanistan. Obviously, Iraq, uh, Israel, Palestine, terrorism, energy security, nuclear proliferation. So it's not just the nuclear issue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on one hand, they, they have these urgent uh, national security challenges, which Iran presents. Uh, on the other hand, the ballgame has changed in the last four months because of the popular uprisings in Tehran. And I think the administration, the Obama administration, doesn't want to do anything. They want to continue on this path of engagement, but I think at the same time, they don't want to do anything which could pour water on the momentum of the opposition or somehow alter its trajectory. And I think one, one very legitimate concern that people in Washington and in the administration have is that um, on one hand, we, we, uh, we cannot acquiesce uh, to Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions, uh, especially when you have a regime uh, which unsettles Israeli leaders very much with their Holocaust denial and support for uh, Palestinian uh, uh, rejectionist groups and groups like Hezbollah. So on one hand, it's, that's going to be very difficult for the Obama administration to simply agree to disagree on. And if Iran moves forward with the nuclear ambitions, I think they're going to be forced to take uh, uh, punitive measures. On the other hand, I think they're reluctant to antagonize Iran or get into um, an escalation with Iran uh, because they recognize that Iran could potentially uh, make life much worse for the United States and Iraq and Afghanistan. And these, you know, especially Afghanistan, are important domestic political issues for, for the Obama administration and the Democratic Party. So it's just remarkable the, the enormous challenges which the Obama administration has inherited from uh, the Bush administration and how Iran has a central role in all of these challenges. And the wild card in the deck is really the Israeli threat to uh, attack the nuclear program mm. uh, of uh, uh, Iran. Talk a little about that, because uh, in, in your view, is this a bluff? Is it under serious consideration? And if it were to happen, would, would everything uh, regarding stability in the region unravel? I don't think it's totally a bluff. Uh, I think when you talk to both Israeli officials and U.S. officials, they say this is not uh, an idle uh, uh, threat. Um, I think that this particular government in Israel, the Netanyahu government, takes uh, Ahmadinejad's uh, uh, rhetoric towards Israel very seriously. And it's kind of a toxic combination of uh, uranium enrichment and Holocaust denial, which is, I think, very unsettling for the Israeli public as well, given the fact that Israeli leaders have, have referred to Iran in, as, ex, as an existential threat, is very difficult to walk down from that. Depth. If you've been using this rhetoric for, for many years of the you know, notion of Iran being an existential threat, to suddenly say, well, it no longer is. So I think that Israeli leaders take this very seriously, in particular the Netanyahu government. And if one year from now Iran uh, has not shown any signs uh, that is willing to compromise on enrichment, 
and its rhetoric towards um, Israel uh, remains as it is right now, I certainly think it is within the realm of possibilities that Israel will feel compelled uh, to act. Uh, in terms of the repercussions, uh, my biggest concern is the repercussion domestically, the repercussions domestically within Iran. Um, because my argument with the Israelis is that ultimately the underlying problem uh, we have with Iran has far more to do with the character of its current regime more than its nuclear ambitions in the sense that as long as uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad remains president and Ayatollah Khamenei remains supreme leader, we're never really going to be able to sign a sheet of paper with Iran which allays our suspicions that Iran has abandoned its weapons ambitions. So therefore we need to think about policies which help uh, facilitate the prospects of political reform in Iran. And that, that may well be simply doing nothing and getting out of the way. Uh, but certainly I think uh, attacking Iran militarily would be the best gift to the hardliners in Tehran in a sense I think it would uh, likely heal uh, the internal political rifts and, and quell uh, popular outrage. So I think that a military attack on Iran would simply prolong the shelf life or in further entrench uh, the most radical elements of this regime for many years to come. So it sounds like the ideal situation, but with one exception, which I'll mention in a minute, is that this thing plays out over time and it becomes a game of bluffing and threats. Uh, uh, and I guess the one problem here is that the argument could be made that under that situation, uh, moderate sanctions are imposed, uh, that uh, uh, Iran can continue with its nuclear program and be that much closer to being one step away from actually uh, having a nuclear bomb. <coughs> uh, so, uh, so what is your perspective on this? Mm. Uh, that, that, in other words, you're saying that nothing probably will be resolved, but we need to continue the dance. Well, you know, we, we have to kind of figure out uh, or try to um, discern what is driving Iran's nuclear ambitions. You know, is it a sense of national pride? Is it a sense of uh, uh, regional insecurity? Is it a sense of insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the United States? And so what's the impetus for Iran's nuclear ambitions? And, and, and try to go to the root source. And I think this is what the Obama administration has tried to do. Uh, the argument which many people have is that Iran is pursuing this nuclear program because they feel a profound sense of insecurity vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So I think the Obama administration is trying to eliminate their problem and reassure them. Um, so far, it hasn't really borne much fruit. And the, the conclusion I've kind of reached is that this conflict we have with Iran is a conflict which isn't likely to be resolved anytime soon, although I, I hope we can, uh, we, 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 we can resolve it. But my own personal sense is that it's a conflict which has to be contained and managed more than resolved. And, you know, Harry, in the past, I think that um, uh, foreign policies have sometimes, you know, fit on a bumper sticker in the sense that, you know, there's containment and engagement and uh, preemption and Iran policy is no longer going to fit on a bumper sticker. It's going to be kind of a combination of various things. We're going to have this door of dialogue that remains open. Um, but I think, you know, th th there's unlikely to be a uh, resolution which ends all claims between the United States and Iran and I think we're likely going to continue to have um, various concerns with Iran and, and concerns which were uh, going to not eliminate, but we'll just have to we'll have to contain them. Um, and you know, one one thing I also sometimes add is that, um, apart from uh, what's fueling Iran's nuclear ambitions, I think there's something instructive in understanding their negotiating behavior, and that is that there's a direct correlation between the value we, the outside world, but particularly the United States, place on Iran's nuclear program and the value which Iran places on it. It's kind of the, I was bring up the analogy of the carpet bazaar. When you go inside a carpet bazaar and you see a carpet which you really love, never show the merchant how much you love the carpet because if he knows you love it and you're not going to leave the shop without it, he feels he can extract a very high price for it. 
And, you know, I think the Iranians say well, the U.S. is obsessed with our nuclear carpet, well, then offer us the corresponding price. So I think paradoxically, one way that our leverage has been enhanced is by turning down the volume a little bit. I think the Obama administration has turned down the volume a little bit, and I think uh, it is paradoxically has somewhat enhanced our leverage. Uh, uh, but this, if the U.S. is in the bazaar and the Obama administration is subtle enough not to focus on one particular rug, mm. uh, they brought along the Israelis yeah. who are focused. So, so there is, there's a dynamic. That's here. absolutely right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. Now, how do China and Russia fit into the equation if uh, the U.S. were to decide for some moderate or light form of sanctions? You know, I think that uh, what we've seen in the past is that um, the Chinese have kind of followed Russia's lead at the Security Council with regards to Iran policy, and the Russian game has been to uh, sign on to sanctions, which they themselves have diluted significantly. So they can uh, tell the United States and the Europeans that, you know, you see we're on board to sanctions, and then Simultaneously, they wink to the Iranians and they say, you know, you see, we've diluted these sanctions and they're negligible for you. So they've been kind of playing both sides uh, of the fence the last few years, the Russians have. And I actually think that the Russians don't really have an incentive to see this conflict resolved anytime soon uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, particularly from an economic perspective. You know, Russia has the world's largest reserves of natural gas. Iran has the world's second largest reserves of natural gas. And Iran could be a major competitor to Russia in European uh, uh, gas markets. Europeans are primarily reliant, uh, heavily reliant on, 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 on Russian natural, natural gas uh, these days. And Iran hasn't been able to exploit its natural gas resources as long as it remains in this, I would describe as a self-inflicted isolation. So I think certainly the last thing that the Russians want to see is uh, some type of a U.S.-Iran rapprochement in which Iran emerges from isolation and begins to challenge uh, Russia economically. Uh, and I think another uh, point which is important is the fact that Russian leaders certainly don't want to see a nuclear-armed Iran, but I think that uh, for Russian leaders, opposing this perceived unipolar world order is a much more important priority for them than averting the prospect of a nuclear-armed uh, Iran. So I think that they're reluctant to, to follow the U.S. on this position uh, because, you know, they want to kind of assert their own uh, sort of independence. And, you know, lastly, I would argue that uh, kind of not taking a clear stance has actually been to Russia's benefit the last few years because as long as they sit on the fence, the, the debate in Washington is, you know, what more incentives can we offer Russia to get them on board? To sanctions and, and privately behind closed doors, that's also the debate, the, the debate in Tehran. You know, what more can we offer the Russians to to get them on board? Uh, with regards to China, I think it's a much more commercial relationship. You know, China is a huge energy consumer, Iran is an energy producer, and you know they simply want to continue doing business um, with Iran. Um, but I, th I think that you know, if there were to be a U.S.-Iran uh, rapprochement, I don't think the Chinese would. Um, suffer as a result of that. I think it's a purely uh, commercial relationship. Looking at the um, the U.S. foreign policy uh, making process and the debate here, uh, uh, what what uh, do you think uh, in that American discussion uh, bodes ill for a kind of a, a rational uh, uh, approach to mm. this problem? Because you're, you're telling us that what we need is patience, mm. uh, a subtle understanding of the various dynamics at play within Iran and within the region, mm. uh, and uh, uh, carrying, persevering over time. Sure. So, so what, what, what worries you the most in the debate, and what are you most positive about in the American debate and policy process? I think, you know, part of the problems is that Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, pushes the worst possible buttons in the context of domestic U.S. politics with this, you know, belligerence toward Israel and denial of the Holocaust. He, I think, conjures up emotions, uh, visceral emotions uh, in, in, in people. And it makes it that much more difficult to 
uh, accept Iran's nuclear ambitions when you have a president which is uh, um, you know, so, so belligerent on these fronts. I remember uh, one of President Bush's former speechwriters once um, quipped with me that he said, you know, you can be belligerent toward Israel and um, you can enrich uranium, but you can't do both of these at the same time. That's unacceptable. Um, so, so I think the Obama administration has um, you know, handled this as, as well as can be expected. Uh, they cannot take a policy of simply saying, well, um, we're going to ignore um, Iran's ambition, nuclear ambitions and we're going to ignore the rhetoric. They, they have to appear that they're focused on the problem and the, the, they're tough. Um, but at the same time, I think that um, they've projected the dignity and the poise of a superpower uh, rather than Iran set kind of the, um, set the tone of the rhetoric. Uh, they haven't stooped down to Iran's level. And I think that, you know, they've been willing to maintain this door of dialogue, uh, or keep, keep that door of dialogue open. Uh, but, you know, eventually they may be faced with very difficult uh, uh, problems in the sense that, you know, one year from now, if um, the negotiations with Iran haven't uh, proven fruitful and Iran has, is continuing to more, move forward uh, on its nuclear ambitions, um, it's going to be very difficult for them to continue justifying um, uh, engaging Iran um, if, if there hasn't been any kind of tangible results of diplomacy. And there's going to be a lot of pressure from the Israeli end uh, to take action to, to avert the prospect of a nuclear armed Iran. Well, on that note, uh, Karim, I want to thank you very much for coming out to the West Coast uh, and appearing on our program. This was quite a treat hearing your very subtle, mm. rational, and calm approach to this set of problems. Thank, thank you, you, Harry. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.